the Fed is made up of um, some human beings. What year did the Fed start? 1913. The Federal Reserve Act of 1907 led into the uh, beginning of uh, the Federal Reserve in, in 1913. And so I want to start off today thinking a little bit more about the Federal Reserve. And it's really the Federal Reserve system. <coughs> Because it's uh, it's kind of a collection of, of different um, constituents, and the leader of the pack, kind of the bigwigs, if you will, is the seven-member board of governors. Governors. The seven-member board of governors. So there's seven people in the United States that really are the key people that control the supply of money in the United States. Now, last time we talked about definitions of money, and we learned that it goes beyond this. What else did money include? as defined by, let's say, M1 or M2 with the government. What else did it include? Checking account balances for M1, and then M2 added on savings account balances, certificates of depression, and money market accounts. Okay, so some other accounts. And so um, the money supply goes beyond the currency. And these seven members control um, some policies that we'll talk about today, as well as how much of this gets effectively printed off through the printing press, how much currency is floating around. Okay, so there's a seven member board, and that, those seven members serve 14 year staggered terms. They serve 14 year staggered terms terms. How long of a term does our president serve? Four. And how many t other times can he be there in that position? One more, so eight years total, but a four-year term. How about some of these other politicians out there? Six years. Now, some of those politicians can serve continually. They don't have to get out of there. So one of the uh, things, in my humble opinion, that I think plague our system is having 30-year politicians, career politicians, that we don't have some people churning in, in their positions. But the Federal Reserve Board, they serve 14-year staggered terms, so that's pretty long, pretty long time. What do we mean by staggered? What do you think it means by staggered terms? Good, yeah, so they expire at different times so that we always have some overlap. So if you imagine uh, the 14 year terms look like this. All right, for the seven members, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that one member's term is, they're not all expiring at one time. So that that's, uh, provides some continuity maybe to the, to the board. Um, now it turns out, these seven members rarely serve the full 14 year term. Why do you think they rarely serve? What, what do you think would be some reasons that they rarely serve the full term? New president? New president? Uh, good, good point to bring out, but no, the president can't take away their, their term. So, uh, but what you're bringing up is one reason why we have 14 year staggered terms is so that no one president really elects all of them at one time either, right? So as far as the terms coming up, because all of these, all of these people are appointed by the president. Pre appointed by the president, conferred by the Senate, so they have to uh, get in there and, and get approved. But the president appoints them, so that's one reason we have that. 
So, but a lot of them voluntarily leave before their 14 years is up. Move on to Congress and maybe move on. They, they want to move on, but they typically don't move on to Congress. They don't move on into other political positions. But who finds their information that they've been inside the secret trust of seven members that control the supply of money and control interest rates? Who do you think would like to maybe hire them? Private banks, investment banks, uh, Wall Street, Goldman Sachs, they'd like having one of those uh, people who have served in that position there. So they go from making uh, probably uh, under 200,000 to seven figures potentially working on Wall Street. So there's a nice little incentive for them to go and leave after they've kind of done their public service. All right. Um, so the chair, the chair is an important position. The chair serves a four year renewable term. The chair serves a four year renew renewable term. And some people argue that the chair of the Federal Reserve is the second most powerful position in Washington. Who do you think's first? The president. Yeah, Obama's got that red button that he can just roll over to sleep and he just presses it and we start nuclear war or something, right? World War III is going. So uh, President Obama, Obama uh, conveys a lot of power. So, but a lot of people argue that the chair sir, is uh, the second most powerful person in Washington, D.C. Why? What does it mean to have power? If you have power, what do you have? Money? Maybe. But we just kind of went through, yeah, um, influence probably more important than money because the chair here only makes probably $170,000 a year maybe, $180,000. I'm not sure exactly, but something south of two hundred, I think. So they don't have money, but they've got power. They've got influence, right? So if, if they can make some maneuvers to lower interest rates for the US economy, who does that affect? Who does that influence? Who does lower interest rates influence? Let's list them off here. Who does lower interest rates influence? Businesses, right? So businesses like that, that they can borrow money at a lower rate. Who else does it influence? Consumers who want to get car loans and mor home mortgage loans, right? So we've got them, we've got maybe even some governments, state governments, local governments, so, um, and the United States government for that matter, that all get influenced. So as far as our, our island goes with its, with its agents, if you control the amount of borrowing that goes on through the interest rates, through influencing interest rates, you really can influence all 300 million people on the island in some way, shape, or form. Because everybody on here is either a saver or a borrower for the most part, right? Very few people do run themselves a balanced budget. Like they earn their income and then they spend it. They're either saving a little bit of it and earning an interest rate or they're borrowing. So very powerful position to be in, in the in the grand scheme of things. Okay, um, so let's I guess add one more bullet here on wh what the powerful thing comes from. Uh, influence on interest rates, which impacts business, households and government. Now, I kind of left government off. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Is the Fed the government? Is the Federal Reserve a government institution? It is. 
It is a government institution. So it's kind of like, well, wait a second, the influence of the interest rates, but they are the government. So what's going on? What's going on here? And therefore, if they're the government, does Obama have the red button for nuclear war and the green button for low interest rates? Like Obama can roll over and say, hit the red button or the green button. You know, have, what, if they're the government, how are they one and the same? That the president won't have kind of the trump card on everything. And the reason that they're considered the second most powerful is that when the chair wakes up in the morning, she, we haven't gotten to her name yet, but you guys have heard it before, she can roll over, and when Obama hits the green button, she can do this. <laughs> I'm not doing the full, this is the, the PG rated run. This is kind of blurred out for you. You see what she's doing? She can do this to the president. So she doesn't answer to the president. The Federal Reserve chairperson and the Federal Reserve itself is completely independent of the federal government. Congress, the judges, Congress, Supreme Court, all of that is all separate. They run their own show, which is a little scary at first, but there turns out to be some good reasons why we want that separation, and that turns out to be pretty important. We'll see that later. But we're uncovering kind of our first most, one of our most important aspects of monetary policy in the United States is that although this is a federal government institution, the Federal Reserve System and the Federal Reserve Bank, it's completely independent in terms of its operations and authority. It has complete autonomy in its decisions on what it does with the money supply. And that's, that's pretty darn important. So um, we've got the influence on the interest rates and maybe even more important, it is independent of other government uh, areas other government influence. Things like the President, Congress, uh, Supreme Court, none of those people can do anything to change, in theory, what the chair wants to do. Okay, so who is our chair? I already gave you a hint, it's a female, so who's our chair? Anybody remember? Anybody know? I think I got my extra credit pen out. The chair of the Federal Reserve. Nobody, huh? Okay, it looks like we got some our work ahead of us in this chapter. So, the chair of the Federal Reserve is Janet Yellen. Did you say her name was Janet? Janet Yellen, yep. Okay. You're a little late. I just, I just put out the Janet before you said it, but I don't know if you would have got the, the Yellen anyway. You're right, I did say it uh, the other time, so glad everybody was listening to that important message that I had the other day. Um, so, Janet Yellen is the current uh, chair. Um, does anybody know the previous chair? Ben Bernanke. ben Bernanke. All right, so previous to that was Ben Bernanke. Prior to that was Alan Greenspan. Prior to that was a guy by the name of Paul Volcker. And the only reason I wanted to go back to Paul Volcker, you're not going to be uh, responsible for that. I don't think it, it's probably, well, he's, he's mentioned, he's pretty, he was pretty important back in the 80s. But I did want to mention it because an Ottawa alumni, an Ottawa alum, was one of these seven people. This is a pretty big deal. So what's the name of our school of business? The Angel Snyder School of Business. Now, Angel Snyder are two different people. One is Wayne Angel, the other one is Sherwin Snyder. They were two 
important professors here. Wayne got his undergraduate degree here, then he went to KU for his PhD, then he came back to Ottawa and was a professor here for about 20, 25 years. And then in 1985, President Reagan, you've heard of Reagan? President Reagan appointed Wayne Angel to the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Pretty high spot to get to. And he served from, I think, 1985 to 1993. And then Wall Street called Wayne. I haven't asked Wayne how much the paycheck was. Maybe he'll tell me. I'll, I'll try to. Wayne's still alive today. He's, he's uh, late 80s. Maybe he might have even getting close to 90. Um, but I've, uh, I chatted with him last, last month. So my position here is the Wayne Angel Chair of Economics. Uh, Wayne donated, he was uh, the first million dollar donor back to Ottawa University. And he created my position to, to secure uh, uh, economics here as best as, as he could with, the, with some dough anyway. So, um, so he made a, a nice donation to the university. And um, he turned out to be pretty influential on that board. This was in the 1980s when we went through a big recession. And Paul Volcker at the time had to make some big time moves. And I kind of later learned as I've gotten the inside that uh, Wayne Angel had quite a bit to say about the direction that the Fed took back in those days. So that was, that was a pretty cool story that we've got some uh, connections back to there. All right, so Janet Yellen, our Ben Bernanke, this is the current chair. You should know that. And this is previous. Last term, Ben Bernanke is the one that kind of guided us through the um, financial crisis. Um, in fact, since our textbook is a little bit dated, it's not been updated to Janet Yellen, so you won't see Janet Yellen's name. Actually, I think she's in there on another unrelated thing, but not as not as chair because she she's been playing some uh, um, impo important roles in D.C. prior to getting the chair. Um, so you'll see Ben's name listed there is one reason I wanted to bring that up. So um, kind of an OU note here. Wayne Angel, <clears throat> OU alum, 1955 I think is roughly when he graduated, served on the board from 1990 or 1985 to 1993, I think, roughly that time range. So he made it eight years, left early, and went to Bear Stearns on Wall Street. So he kind of had a wall, he was chief economist at Bear Stearns on Wall Street and did some forecasting and other things there. And then he, after that stint, I don't, I can't remember how long he was there, then he had his own private consulting firm. Okay. Um, so that's one, that's kind of our central bank in action. Then there's another, another piece to the puzzle here. So I guess if I was putting numbers on this, you guys can put a one there maybe. That's all related to the seven member board business. Um, number two is that there is um, a 12 member Federal Open Market Committee. Federal Open Market Committee. And we're gonna talk a lot about what these guys do. The FOMC, the 12 member FOMC they partake in maneuvers by the Federal Reserve in the bond market to influence interest rates. And so there's a lot of interesting stuff that's gone on. The 12 members here are the seven of these people plus five more um, that come from the Federal Reserve banks that we'll talk about in a second. So the 12 members here are the seven member Board of Governors plus four rotating members 
of bank presidents, which we'll talk a little bit more about here in a second, plus one is the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Fed Bank President of New York. And all of that totals up to 12 people. So we've got five bank presidents and then the seven member board. And that group is, is pretty important in making decisions about the money supply. Uh, I'll, I'll try to get that cleared up here in a second. The, the, the main meeting place where the Federal Reserve Board goes is in DC. And then each of the, there's banks scattered throughout the United States. I'm gonna write that down here in a sec. So this, this group here, uh, these 12 members make decisions on the money supply through open market operations. We're gonna define that later. I just want for your notes to write down they use open, or use open market operations to change the money supply. So this will just be the link back on some other stuff we'll talk about in a bit. Okay. So number three, we've got now the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, the FOMC, and now we don't want to forget about the 12 Federal Reserve Banks. which is kind of confusing. <laughs> so if you, uh, this is getting to be tougher and tougher to do. I've been doing this for years, but they don't always print it anymore. If you guys have your your wallets with one dollar bills. I like to see how many Federal Reserve Banks we can come up with. So if you've got a buck or two, you won't find it on bigger bills. But on, let me just use this ten dollar bill. On this little emblem here, it'll show you the bank that it was made at. So what bank it was drawn at. And as we start to change out the currencies, we're not going to be able to do this exercise. Do you guys see any of them there? Uh, no. Coins are at the Denver Mint. That's where the coins are produced. I believe so, but... Uh, so what do, you guys, what do you guys got? There might be more, Bo. So on that little insignia, right here... There's an Atlanta. We found an Atlanta. Cleveland, Chicago, New York, Dallas, San Fran, St. Louis, Boston. Any other ones? How many do we get? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's four more out there. Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Are we just guessing or you got it? It's on your dollar. Okay, great. Well, that was more. I was just curious if we can get all 12. Well, we can start getting the rest of them. I just want to know how many dollars covered them. Any other ones? So we can start guessing the rest of the. I just like to see how many dollars we actually covered in class. So you guys did pretty good here if we got up to nine. Yeah. Kansas City, there is one, and Rich, so now we're getting into the other one. So we got Richmond, Virginia, Kansas City. I've taken students to the Kansas City Fed um, usually each year, so that's a pretty cool tour. How many have we got? Are we missing one? Uh, yeah, not Ottawa, Kansas. Cleveland, Atlanta, Boston, Philadelphia, Richmond, KC. Oh, Minneapolis. How could I forget? I had it in my head earlier. That's where I'm from. I've been to the Minneapolis Fed. So I've been to the Minneapolis Fed, the Kansas City Fed, and the Chicago Fed. 
If you get a chance to go, they're pretty cool to, to look at. So the Federal Reserve System has banks scattered through, what year was the Federal Reserve System created? 1913. Why do you think we have banks scattered through the system that represent the Federal Reserve? The Central Bank of the United States is essentially reflected in these 12 banks, plus the seven members, of course, that are serving in Washington, DC. That's the system. Why was it set up that way in 1913? Didn't have to travel too far with money, so there was some physical limitations with uh, taking care of accounting and funds. What else? What else might be important as we think about San Francisco, Boston, Dallas, Chicago, uh, Minneapolis? Bigger, bigger areas. So yeah, as we move west, the population was a little different. Did Cal was California as big in 1913 as it was today? Yeah. No, so it's kind of growing, so that we kind of slowed down as we moved west. In fact, Kansas City was one of the last ones before we, we got out that far. So one of the reasons we had the feds this way is so that people started to be more attached and a little more comfortable with the government printing off the money and taking control of the money supply. So then they could say if, the, if things weren't so good in San Francisco or St. Louis, they felt like they had somebody they could go to and complain, hey, you know, life sucks here. And another reason that they had it is so that the bank president would naturally live in that community. And so they'd have a better fix of what's going on maybe with local issues or regional issues in Kansas City, because Kansas City and Boston are much different from each other, right? It could possibly be that Boston is booming and Kansas City is tanking. And so at least we had a voice when we started to have meetings and we're starting to gather data of a real human being that's living in that region reflecting the conditions of it. Yeah, and they might have multiple houses you know, in different places, of course, but they're literally going to work each day at the bank. Okay. So the, I mean, to some degree, they're, they're in that community regularly. These are the bank presidents of each one of these branches, the 12. And then over on the West Coast, there ended up being some, some sub-branches to cover more territory as the West grew. They ended up having some ones that fell under the umbrella of San Francisco, but there was a couple more for coverage uh, on the West Coast as, as things grew. Okay, so a decentralized system because in the United States, did we like central authority? When we go back, those of you who have studied a little bit of history and we think of Thomas Jefferson in 1776, and, and who are we sick and tired of? The central authority, King of England, we had a few problems, Boston Tea Party, we said this sucks, I don't want you telling us what to do, we're not sending our money your way. We're gonna create our own sovereign nation that's gonna be ruled by law rather than ruled by men. I'd rather have a nation built on something ruled by some fixed rules rather than the discretion of some king or queen. Right? That was the idea. And so this was a big deal in the United States. This was fought tooth and nail whether we should even do a central bank. That's why it took so long. Again, 1776 to 1913, there's a long stretch of US history where we operated without a central bank. Okay? Questions or comments there? All right. Um, just so we have it in our, in our notes here, um, I wanted to put down what we talked about last time. I don't think I gave you this name, if I remember right. What is the currency backed by? Gold or silver? Backed by hopes and dreams. That's right. In God we trust. That's about all you got going for you. Those of you who are non-believers, you're in big trouble. But it just says, in God we trust on the currency. 
That's all you got. In, in Janet we trust, it might as well say, because that's part of who's responsible for having that money retain its value is really with Janet and those seven people uh, in terms of deciding not to just run the old printing press like we did last time. That is where the value comes from. Your value that you place from it is in that somebody else will take it off your hands. It's kind of a hot potato. You guys kind of know that game, a hot potato? Who's going to be stuck with the, who's going to be stuck with the cash? So when Armageddon happens and, and we're facing the end of the world, do you want to be holding a big pile of currency? No. And in fact, you probably don't need the, the money in your bank account either. Both forms of money, your account balances and your money. If everything falls apart, you want food, shelter, clothing, maybe an automobile. You guys have seen Waterworld, maybe some of those, some of those movies. Water might be pretty important all of a sudden. Right? Gasoline. All of a sudden, real tangible things are going to be what's important, not money. So money's kind of a hot potato. It works great as long as everybody's you know, cooperating with each other in the market system. But it has no intrinsic value all on its own. It is what we call fiat money. So note, currency is not backed by gold or anything else. It is called fiat money. Fiat means unbacked, unbacked currency. The government calls it legal tender. Can't remember that word's on here somewhere too, I think. Yeah. So if you read closely on the lines here, it says, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. So the government told us that this is legal tender. And that's all we got going for us, is that it's okay to, to shop around. All right, so how does that make you feel about the monetary system so far? You guys feeling pretty good? It's, it feels a little sketchy, doesn't it? I mean, so we've got our currency that's not backed by anything real, and it's controlled by how many people out of the 300 million people on our island? How many people control the supply of money? 12. 12, arguably one, seven. One, one, one. Arguably one wields more power in terms of setting the agenda for the meeting. So we've got a concentration of power in one spot on something that's pretty important in the United States. So that, that causes, um, causes some concern for some people. And hopefully we'll start to understand maybe, maybe that's OK. Maybe, maybe the world's not going to come to the end. Um, but should we leave these people completely unchecked? Probably not. We might want to have some checks and balances in place and have some transparency of accounting records and whatnot, at least after the fact, as much as we can. So do they still control the gold, too? No, they do not control the gold. So at one point, when we were on the gold standard, the United States confiscated all gold. So they held all of the gold, and gold was not allowed to be a legal tender. You know, you could still have gold chains and stuff, but gold bars and all of that, the United States had it because this was, you've heard of the saying, as good as gold? This was as good as gold. So when it originally started in 1913, you indeed could go to Kansas City and say, excuse me, sir, I'd like to get $10 in gold for that. Right? It was redeemable in gold. There wasn't, it was really backed. So in a sense, instead of carrying around gold in our back pockets, we could carry around this. As long as we have faith that the government had that system in place, it's like, well, this is as good as gold. And that made us feel pretty good, that our currency was tied to something real again and redeemable, uh, if need be, at some point in the future. So when they got rid of the gold standard, what, what are they doing with the gold reserve? <laughs> so yeah, they, they're, they're still holding it. So yeah, we went, uh, there's kind of a long story that I won't have time to get into, but you, there's lots of good videos and stuff I can point you to afterwards. But um, 
During the Great Depression, we ended up going off of the gold standard, but it was kind of a modified gold standard where other currencies were based off the dollar and the dollar was linked to gold, and so it was kind of this modified system. Um, but the government really didn't follow all the rules perfectly, and eventually it became a big mess. And in 1972, President Nixon abandoned the gold standard altogether. And now we just have what we have now today, fiat money unbacked currency. Okay, so again, there's a long, long history of that. That's uh, You can check it on your own. It's talked, I think, a little bit about in the textbook, but um, not enough time in this class to, to hit it. All right, um, another concept I want to put out there for you to discuss that you'll see in the book is the monetary base, MB, the monetary base. The monetary base is the amount of Federal Reserve notes this is currency, cash, plus banks' deposits at the Fed. And then we actually throw in coins, too, since coins, coins is just kind of a little drop of water in the big bucket of things. It doesn't make up a lot, but this is referred to as the monetary base. And we use that terminology because the Fed watches this closely in determining what the supply of money is out there. And from an accounting standpoint, Federal Reserve notes are kind of like, in theory, a liability of the Fed, even though here's, here's, what the, here's how the liability works. Luckily, I have another 10 here. So those of you who have maybe some basic accounting, you got assets and liabilities, right? Liabilities is something that you owe. So if we think about the Federal Reserve, they're the ones that printed it off, right? And so then they issue it. And so when the currency's out in circulation, it's kind of a liability to the Fed. But here's what it states. If, Samantha, if you can help me out here. If Samantha comes to the Federal Reserve and says, I demand what this is worth, guess what the Fed is able to pay with? Yeah, so she gives it to me and says, here. I'm like, oh yeah, no problem. That's how the system works. Right? So that's not the same type of liability that businesses face, right? Or when you guys take on a loan, when you take on a loan for a car or something and you owe them, that's a liability. That debt is a liability. Well, the Fed, because they wrote the rules, have that little rule is that they can always pay you back with more currency. So it's kind of a silly rule, really, right? It's, so it's, it's kind of. Uh, uh, kind of just mental gymnastics at that point. But Federal Reserve notes are liability to the Fed. Banks' deposits at the Fed. Le on Monday, I talked about the Fed being the banker's bank. So the Fed was the banker's bank. Why were they the banker's bank? What was the purpose of that in 1913? What were they trying to address? The Fed, the central bank, acts like the banker's bank. What was the purpose of that? So if one tree fell. If one fell, they could go to the bank, the Fed, and get money for it, right? So it was a, like an insurance policy. You guys put your money on deposit at a bank, and now that bank has to hold a fraction of it on deposit with the Fed. And that's supposed to make us feel better about keeping our money in a bank because there's kind of a little insurance policy. And then we didn't get into talking about the, the FDIC insurance. That came in uh, a little bit later to protect against banks going completely belly up um, that uh, the government would step in and for deposits originally up to $100,000, if you had that money on deposit at a bank, the government would fund that because they can just do this again. Mm -hmm and pay you out the 100. 
And that gave us some assurance to avoid uh, some of those bank runs. Um, but that FDIC insurance now is up to 250000 which was raised during the last, this great re recession that we had starting in 2008. So people were starting to get extra scared, and so they raised that limit. So the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, um, has a $250,000 policy that you kind of get for free um, when you put your money into a bank. It ends up being buried into the bank expenses. They kind of run it like an insurance uh, deal. Um, and something that maybe they could handle on their own. But um, so those are kind of the two layers of protection to try to bring security to that. So um, in your homework problems, you might see something related to the monetary base in terms of the money multiplier, which was a little bit different than the deposit multiplier we did last time. So the money multiplier, let's just call it MM. And the money multiplier is equal to the money supply divided by the monetary base. Here's the monetary base again. It reflects the kind of the cash component, less the amount that banks have on deposit at the Fed. It's kind of the base that supports the money system. So last time we went through the deposit multiplier which said that if I get a loan, if I put my 10,000 bucks from the shoebox into my account at Peoples, Peoples is gonna go and loan that out. If the required reserve ratio is 20%, they're gonna loan out 8,000 of it. That 8,000 eventually makes it into somebody's cash register that eventually makes it into another bank. Who'd we go to next? Was it Wells Fargo? Was that the next one? goes into Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo now has $6,400 to loan to Zach so that he can buy his home entertainment system at Best Buy. Best Buy takes that 6,400, deposits it into First National Bank, and now there's more money. So what we learned there was that currency, or money held on deposit at a bank creates more money. So loans, the loan process, and the fractional banking system that we use end up creating more money. This is the base, the monetary base, that supports the money supply, the full money supply. So notice that this here, I like to just put that this is the fully multiplied money supply. Maybe it's M2, for instance, one of our measures of money. So the money supply here includes currency plus all of the checking accounts plus all of the savings accounts plus all the money market accounts plus all of the CDs. So it includes all of those accounts. All right, if I take this number and divide it by this number, it gives me something greater than one, and that is the multiplier. So let me just put a little, do a short little example, hopefully, to drive home the point here. So if the Fed uh, increases the money supply by two billion, by two billion dollars, one way or the other. And the current money supply 
equals 300 billion. The current money supply is 300 billion with the monetary base equal to 30 billion. What is the increase in the money supply? And maybe I should say, what is the final increase in the money supply? So look at these equations here. What'd you say? Uh, no, not 100. So first of all, we can calculate the money multiplier. Money supply currently is 300 billion. The monetary base I gave to you was 30 billion. So what's the multiplier, the money multiplier? 10, 300 divided by 30 is 10. So that's the multiplier. If the Fed runs the printing press to the tune of 2 billion, so they press the button, and we're gonna talk different ways they press the button, but if they press the button and go, right, and we print off 2 billion more of the monetary base, the monetary base grows by 2 billion, what is the final change in the money supply going to be? 20 billion. That money is going to be multiplied 10 times over through that process that we did with Peoples to Wells Fargo to First National Bank. That's the multiplying process. All right, so our answer down here, what is the final change in the money supply? The change in the money supply will equal 20 or 10 the money multiplier, let me write that out, the money multiplier times the change in the monetary base, which equals 10 times 2 equals 20. I know I'm getting low here on the board for you guys. The change in the money supply is that multiplier of 10. 10 times 2 is 20. So now we've looked at two different types of multipliers. So is that two billion a change in the monetary base? Yes. So the because it's as if the Fed ups the money supply by two billion. So we calculate kind of that they estimate the money multiplier given the current situation. And then if there's two million injected, it'll change by twenty. It'll, it'll go through that system. So it'll go up to 320 up here ultimately. That'll be the change in the money supply. Okay? And we just kind of leave it short and simple looking at the changes rather than getting too crazy. So I know this is, this is crazy for some of you, but uh, um, it, it, gets cra it gets uglier. So we'll try to keep it a little basic. All right, so um, recall the deposit multiplier. This is what we did last time. The deposit multiplier. And in our example, we were showing, we were using different variables than what we just did with the monetary base. So we had the change in the money supply going through this deposit multiplication process <coughs> using our excess reserves. So we had the 1 over the required reserve ratio times the change in excess reserves. So in your notes, this was the one where I said, well, what if we had, uh, how does that work? What does that number end up being with the whole uh, Peoples to Wells Fargo to First National Bank? those deposits keep getting multiplied. It was 8,000 times 5 gave us 40. So that should be in your notes from last time, right? Just kind of 
refreshing your memory there. Um, <clears throat> this shows the max, the absolute maximum that the money supply could change by. In other words, it's actually not realistic. In the story, what was the required reserve ratio? What was RRR that I had? 0 0.2. 0 0.2, it was 20%. So in other words, if somebody put in a $100 deposit, the bank had to hold back $20 of it, they could loan out 80 of it. Now. In that chain of events, I want to go back to the story where we got the, the people's thing. And who was our car? Was that Matt? Oh, so Matt was buying, buying the car for 8000 right? In that chain of events, what would have caused the multiplier to be truly smaller? In that story, what could have happened in the real world that would have caused the money supply to be smaller. Bartering. Say that again. Bartering. Bartering? No, we can. Uh, uh, that could have gone on, but that's kind of taking money out of the equation. So I want to keep money kind of in the equation somehow. Taxes. Taxes would have been a leakage out. You're absolutely correct. But then it would have gone into some government's pocket or government would have spent it somewhere else. So it would have kind of stayed in the system still. But great, great point to bring up. So think about the story about um, Zach, since he's gone, I'll pick on him. Uh, Zach having the $6,400 loan, right? He goes to Best Buy. What did I assume Best Buy did with the next step with the money? Put it on deposit with who? First National Bank. Now, what, is it likely that Best Buy would put all $6,400 on deposit with the bank? No. no. They'd keep something back maybe for the next day's business or maybe to buy some new supplies or whatever, right? So they're going to retain some of that cash when they put it on the, give it to the bank. Now on the flip side, is the bank, do they have to loan out? all of that excess. No. In fact, they might face some circumstances where they're not going to loan out the full 6400 They might just be willing to loan out 6000 or 5000 or whatever, whatever circumstances. The Federal Reserve says that the maximum you can loan out is 80 But if you choose to only loan out 70 or something or 75 that's your choice. You can hold back more. You just can't do, you can't do more than um, uh, more loans than 80%. So those represent a couple leakages in the system, what we call currency drain. So this shows the maximum that the money supply can change by. In reality, there is currency drain. Currency drain. And it comes to us in two spots. Currency being drained out of the system or being held on to. One, the um, business. Let's just let's just tie it back to our example. Best Buy may not deposit all sixty-four. Best Buy may not deposit all 6400 They might keep some cash for operations. If they only deposit 6000 then you can immediately see that our whole multiplying system gets less. There's less bang for the buck going into that. Number two is that uh, Wells Fargo may not 
loan out all excess, I don't even want to use that word, loan out the maximum allowed by law. So we've got how your textbook handles this is defining desired reserves. DR. These are the amount of reserves that the bank wants to hold back that may be greater than required reserves, the amount that they have to hold back by law. So banks um, choice of how much not to loan out. It's not the best sentence in the world. Hopefully it conveys the message. How much they want to hold out. Note DR, desired reserves, have to be greater than or equal to, but cannot be less than, required reserves. So this is required reserves that the Federal Reserve says they have to hold back a minimum of this. They can choose to have more than that if they want, but they at least have to have that. All right, so some of the stuff I'm going over now, you might need to reference back when you do some homework problems or as you're thinking about the test. These are a couple definitions that can be a little bit slippery on getting the concept down. So really kind of tell me if you're not quite getting that concept. And then I got to hit you with another one here. And that is actual reserves. Actual reserves. Actual reserves are equal to vault cash, the money that the bank actually has on hand at any given point in time, and its deposits at the Fed, the banker's bank concept. So if people come in and say, hey, I'll put my money with you, I'll put my money with you, I'll put my money with you, all of a sudden vault cash starts to pile up, right? And so they've got excess that they can loan out. So that is our definition of excess reserves, ER. Excess reserves equal actual reserves minus the amount we want to hold back, desired reserves. So then you can kind of work your way backwards here. This is the amount that they can loan out. So at the end of the day, this is what the bank has decided. Let's make some loans and make some money with our excess reserves. 
money sitting around the bank that's in excess of the amount I want to just keep on hand at the bank, my desired reserves. Okay, questions or comments on that? Woo, we got some fun stuff now. Banking, banking 101. We talked last time, sometimes it's good to step back from this for a moment um, to remember how do banks make money? Making loans. There was more to that story. It had to deal with interest. Good, good. That's kind of the full, that's to really catch the whole thing. So nice job, Jake. Charging more interest on loans than what they pay out to depositors with their accounts. They capture that spread. So that's the little example we went through. And so they decide how much they want to hold back. Um, it's possible for them to go to the max. So it's possible for desired reserves to equal required reserves. And they start loaning it out. This desired business is something that happened in the, in the financial crisis, just to kind of put a little extra note that's relevant to today's world. Um, in an effort to try to pull the economy out of the crapper, the Federal Reserve started providing lots of liquidity. And they're basically telling banks, go loan money, go loan money, here's money, here's money, here's money. And the banks were like, whoa, I've been burned, I was burned last year on this. Uh, they didn't pay back their loans and we got into trouble. I'm just gonna hold back on lending for a little bit, right? So what they did is they increased their DR. Their desired level of money that they wanna hold back went up. In the golden days, they used to, if we're using our 20% deal, they would loan out 80% all day long. But now they're kind of kicking back and saying, whoa, let's only, let's only loan out 60%, right? So their desired ratio of how much they want to hold back uh, changed. And so that was uh, part of the issue of why the um, monetary stimulus of jacking money into the system didn't work so well because the banks didn't loan it out. In order for that to start to do something, then we have to have the players in there. We have to have Matt's place where he bought the car, deposit, to go, to go, to go, to go. Well, if the bank is holding back more money, that currency drain doesn't enter the system. It doesn't start, doesn't start flowing and giving, giving maybe some, some life. It just sits there. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, so we've kind of danced around the tools of the Fed. And so the next thing we need to look at that might bring some of these topics back together for you is to look at what the Fed actually does for us. And originally, its purpose was to be the banker's bank. And its roles were really quite different in 1913. So what does the Fed do? So number one, it controls, it controls the quantity of money in circulation. Sometimes not as well as they think they can, but in theory, they're the ones printing off the bills, like we said. Number two, it issues currency. It controls the printing press. I should have brought my, uh, my bag of money. You can only get this at the Federal Reserve. You can only get them when you go tour the Federal Reserve. But at, yeah, at the Federal Reserve, as you leave, they give you a little bag of money. 
which you're like, ooh, a bag of money. But it's shredded money. So when those bills get really ratty, you've seen some of those nasty bills where they're kind of you know, all crinkly because some idiot did something like that, right? So they can play basketball or a little game of football or something. All right. So when they start to get really torn and nasty and ripped, well, as they're brought into banks, I learned this actually from a um, student just last semester that, that worked at a bank. When the banks get really nasty, there's a little special spot that the banks are, that the bank tellers put in a box. And when they go to the Federal Reserve to make a deposit at the Fed to, as part of their money, this will be taken out of circulation. And so they, they take this and they run it through the shredder. And now this is, all becomes shreds, and that's what they give you on the tour. So part of what the Fed does is it takes nasty bills out of circulation and gives brand new crispies. And that's kind of a continual process. And there's a, pretty, there's a pretty neat machine in Kansas City that you get to see. There's a viewing area where you can see the money in the big tube that goes out. Uh, on how, the, how it all counts the, the funds, and, and um, I think they explained that one of the hoses goes to the shredder, and it, the, the machine actually prints them out, um, or grabs them as it's, as it's counting them. Okay, so that's part of the function of the Fed. Um, another function is to supervise and monitor the performance of banks. So they're going to kind of watch out for the banks that might be in trouble. So they're in charge of looking at the books of the banks and, and collecting records. So they do a lot of auditing, a lot of accounting. Um, a lot of analyzing of numbers. And so they're going to supervise and monitor if, if a bank isn't falling within guidelines of keeping the right amount of money, they're loaning too much money out, then they can penalize them or, or put some uh, other sort of controls in place to try to get them into compliance. So the banking industry is very heavily regulated. And probably for good reason in some aspects, maybe not so good in other aspects. But well, that's, a, that's again a, a longer story. But um, so number four is to act as the banker's bank. And what that means in a little more detail is that one thing it did more so in the past than it does now is it clears checks between banks. So the Federal Reserve was kind of the referee in the middle <coughs> between the transactions. So when you wrote a check and you sent it to somebody else and they deposited it at their bank at Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo needs to settle up with your bank at Peoples, right? So that transaction of plus $10, minus $10, that's a check clearing process, and that's going to be run through, uh, run through the Federal Reserve. Um, one of the financial innovations that's evolved over the last 30 years is that private companies now serve that purpose. So um, one of them was in Des Moines, Iowa. I wouldn't be surprised if there's somebody, uh, one in the Kansas City metro area, where it's a for-profit business, again, is heavily monitored, but they process the checks. They kind of clear the checks under the uh, supervision of the Fed. All right, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, clears checks and then lends money, lends money to banks that are in trouble and or it being in trouble means they're probably short on required reserves. So I don't think I've used this term 
In the past, they were considered the lender of last resort. The lender of last resort. Ben Bernanke, the former chair, because of the financial crisis, um, and this was started even in the Greenspan era, changed that and started to not make it so um, ugly for banks to go to the Fed for a loan. In other words, in the past, it was always looked upon that, hey, if you go to the Fed for a loan, that, that's bad news. They kind of changed the system around so that uh, banks who are in general pretty healthy can also go to the Fed for a loan if needed. But traditionally, we've got this lender of last resort concept. And in practice, banks try not to go to the Fed for the loan. Go to your parents for a loan. You guys like going to your parents for money and like you really want something, but you don't have the money and it's like you gotta go to your parents and you're like, hmm, right? So as soon as you do that, you've kind of extended yourself out. Maybe they can get into your business a little bit. Well, what do you want this money for? How's it gonna be spent? When are you gonna pay it back? What do you, you know, blah, 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 blah and you don't want to go there. Well, it's kind of the same way for banks. They don't want to go to the Federal Reserve who's monitoring all their stuff. It might kind of set up a red flag. So that's still, still true today. All right. Um, so back to, I want to spend a little more time here on number one and how they control the supply of money. So there are three tools of the Fed to change the money supply. So here's our shorthand notation again, MS, money supply, change the money supply, three tools of the Fed. One is it sets the required reserve ratio. So one of the tools is the required reserve ratio that we've been talking about, the RRR. They're the ones that set that 20%, 10%, 12%. If there's an increase in the required reserve ratio, 20 to 30%, let's say. What happens to the money supply? Does it go up or down? If the required reserve ratio, the fraction that banks have to hold back, if that goes up, maybe from 20% to 30%, what happens to the money supply? Does it go up or down? Down, right? So what we've been thinking about here is, in our example, if I have the $10,000 currency and I deposit that, under the 20% rule, the bank could loan out 8,000. With the 30% rule, they can only lend out seven. And so the change in the money supply is not gonna be as big as it was before. And in fact, overall, it's going to shrink the money supply. If the Fed is shrinking the money supply, less money floating around in the system, are they stimulating the economy or trying to push it down? Is that an expansionary policy? If we think back to our, our business cycle where we've got real GDP moving over time, the ups and downs, right? expansion, peak, recession, trough. Is this an expansionary thing to do for the economy? Contract. To contract the money supply? No. So this is a monetary policy that's contractionary. It's trying to temper down. This might be what the, this is, I should say, what the Federal Reserve is starting to do now 
that has Wall Street and other Main Street and everybody a little bit wondering what the heck's going to happen. The United States economy is starting to come up. We see some upward movement. And the Fed has put so much money into the system that they don't want it to go up too fast. So they start to employ contractionary monetary policy. So let's write this down here. Contractionary monetary policy. Question? It's just to slow it down, not necessarily to keep it from peaking, but we don't want it if we, the perception is, is if we go too fast, too hard, we're going to fall hard. And we'd rather have kind of a, a more stable, smoother approach. And then it's going to tie into some other things that we'll talk about later, too. And the cost of multiplier The value of the dollar, yes, absolutely. And the reason is, is that, um, the deposit multiplier, the, the multiplying process, affects the total money supply. And the total money supply affects the value of the dollar. So those two things are interrelated with each other. So when the Fed does something like this, it can affect the CPI. Yes. Yep. You're putting together some links that we'll, um, that we'll do a little bit later, probably not until Friday. We still got some time today, but we're going to, we might get there today. We'll see. Okay, any other comments there? That's one tool of the Fed. Bo? Oh, that why they, I mean, so they didn't have to do this? Is that why they cut out the bigger bills, like the $500 and the $1,000 bills? No, this has nothing to do with the denomination of the currency as far as how big it is. His question was, does this have something to do with their cutting out a $500 bill and a $1,000 uh, bill? Oops, you guys lost your mic all of a sudden, huh? Did it just happen, or did I just happen to catch that? Yeah, I'm getting it. <laughs> I'm surprised I just happened to catch that. I don't know what, what happened, but it went out. So again, that happened last time. If that happens again, you guys unmute your microphone and let me know. OK, so um, that has nothing to do with the, the level of the currency, because we can either carry five $100 bills or one $500 bill. It really wouldn't matter. So um, we'll have, I think, a, I might do a short video on, on currency values from Zimbabwe. That's kind of interesting. Uh, that, that won't be till Friday for sure. OK, anything else? This is just one tool. There's three of them. Number two is the discount rate. The discount rate. So a little d. The discount rate is the rate the Fed charges uh, banks for loans. The discount rate. Now, what's interesting is that a lot of people perceive the Fed to set interest rates. It's like, oh, the Fed's so powerful. They just set the rates. Why don't they just set this one and set that one and set this one? Well, in reality, this is the only interest rate that the Fed sets that has absolute discretion on that says the discount rate's going to be 1.25%. That's the only interest rate in the nation now start thinking, car loans, home loans, business loans. Loans are all over the place. Those are all market rates. Those are just private companies charging what they feel like charging. Those are market-driven rates. It's the price of money, the price of borrowed funds. Whether you're on the borrowing end or the, the loaning end, the interest rates, the price of money, all of those are set by the invisible hand of the market system. The Federal Reserve sets this interest rate, the discount rate. So let's put that note down here. This is the only rate actually set by 
the Fed. The reason they call it the discount rate is that it's set up as a discount loan. If somebody needs to borrow $10 million, they give them $999 million and they say, pay me back 10 in a month. So the interest is deducted or discounted off the top. That's why they call it a discount loan. It's just one type of loan. It's a different type of loan than we're used to. When we take a car loan, we borrow $10,000 and then we pay back the interest later, right? Our payment includes principal and interest. If I pay off my whole loan a month later, then the car dealership says, give me my 10, back, 10 grand back plus $100 worth of interest, right? So with this, it's discounted off the top is where that, where that word comes from. So the discount, quote unquote, the reason we use that discount word is that interest is deducted on the front end. It's just handled a little bit weird, but sometimes people wonder, well, why do we call it a discount? Because it's a, it's a discount loan. All right. Both of these tools, while are important conceptually, are actually rarely used by the Federal Reserve in terms of controlling the money supply on kind of a day-by-day -day basis, day-by-day, week-by-week basis. So both of these tools are used seldomly. In other words, they might go three months, six months, nine months, maybe even a year before they change one of these two. The required reserves are usually about 10% on small banks and then they kind of ramp down on a schedule. That schedule doesn't change very much. One of the reasons they don't change is from an operational standpoint, if you've got mom and pop bank here in Ottawa, Kansas, and you start jacking around with the required reserves all the time, they have to change all their accounting, right? Everything changes for the small business, so that kind of is a hassle for them. Um, and the discount rate, uh, they kind of use as a marker for things, but it, it doesn't get used, doesn't get changed that much. So number three is the absolute most important tool, and it's called open market operations. Open market operations. And this is the purchase and sale of bonds on the open market. Open to everybody, the free market, if you will. The purchase and sale of bonds market. Okay. What's a bond? What is a bond? We got stocks and bonds. Well, you know, Russ, it's stocks and bonds. It's kind of like a tax write-off or something. Stocks and bonds. I want to focus in on bonds, but before we do, I guess let's Refresh your memory, what's, what's a stock? If you own stock, what do you own? A share of a company, right? So it could be a big company like Best Buy. You own a fraction of that company. You own the right to whatever your little tiny fraction is of the profits from that company. So that's what stocks are, our ownership equity in a company. That company can also sell bonds. What are those? Okay, so it's a, guaranteed is kind of a, a strong word, but a contractual fixed amount return. I say that because if you default on it, then it's not so guaranteed because it's just still their, their word. But basically, that's right, a bond is an IOU. So a bond is an IOU. You guys have maybe done bonds like this. It's a loan, it's, it's borrowing. 
A bond is an IOU. It's a little more formal because it is specifically, it's specifically a piece of paper that goes beyond just the normal loan agreement. So an IOU, let's say uh, the government, we talked about the government running out of money, right? So the government runs out of money, what do they do? Well, they sell bonds. And the bond is a piece of paper that says, okay, I owe you what? Well, you owe me $10 million, okay? So this is called the face value of the bond the face value. So the government needs 10 million. They give a piece of paper that says I owe you 10 million. And here's what it's gonna look like. We're gonna have five years is the term of the bond. And then every year I'm gonna pay you a million dollars of interest. But we're not going to express it as a rate. It's just that amount called the coupon payment. So every year you're going to get a million dollars, one million per year. At the end of five years, you're going to get your 10 million back, I promise. In the meantime, I'm going to pay you a million dollars a year. Love, Obama. That's it. You got Obama's signature on there, it's good as gold. You can take Obama to court if he doesn't pay you back. Unfortunately, they run the court system, but that's a whole other <laughs> story. But in theory, the US government has promised to pay you back these terms. Now here's where a bond is different than normal borrowing. The bond is a marketable security. It is transferable. In other words, you can sell it. So after two years of holding this bond, I can go to Wall Street and say, I want my money. Obama has agreed to these terms. So Obama doesn't have to pay me back. I don't have any arrangement with him, but he's allowed me to sell it to somebody else to take my position over. Now I'm sitting here holding a piece of paper that has three years left on it. At the end of three years, the US government's going to cut whoever's holding this piece of paper a check for $10 million, And in the meantime, they're going to cut them a million dollars a year for the, for the last three years. So this is how a bond gets its value and will ultimately have a price on Wall Street. Somebody's going to say, hey, uh, tell you what, given the current market conditions, I'll pay, I'll pay you $11 million for it right now, right on the spot, cash on the barrel. I'm like, oh, OK, that sounds good. So two parties go and exchange the bond. Enter the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve can come into that marketplace and buy and sell these things just like anybody else. But when they do it, there's a little bit different effect. So here is, let's see if I got, I brought my props today. So here's our bond. This one is, I owe you a million dollars for five years, right? So now, Todd, I'm gonna make you the President of the United States. I want you to sell that to raise some money because you didn't collect enough taxes to pay for your spending. You can sell it to Samantha. Now, on this exchange, Samantha gives the government how much? One million, Samantha, I'll just spot you a little loan here off the table here. Why don't you just pay, pay Mr. President with that for a little bit. Okay, so Mr. President gets that. I'm the Federal Reserve, I'm Janet Yellen. I've never had to do it with a female before. I might have to bring some new props, but okay. So now let's go on with business. Samantha, you can go ahead and start selling that to Wall Street. You can sell it to Sarah. What did uh, Mr. President do with his money? What did he buy? Weapons of, mass Weapons of mass destruction, he decided. And you bought it from your buddy, Matt, who you've known for years, who opens the Guns R Us company, right? And so go ahead and pass that, pass that out. So there's our system. Do you see how, go ahead and sell the bond again. 
so we won't have money exchanging places. But now we've got a we've got a market system here on our island where the bonds and the money is kind of traveling around, right? Okay. So now, what happens if the Federal Reserve goes in and purchases the bond? So Janet comes out into the marketplace and says, hey, I'll take that off your hands, Ryan. What happened to the money supply? It just decreased. It increased, right? Because Matt's holding his money that he got from Guns R Us. Ryan's holding the money from the bond. I, Janet Yellen, the Federal Reserve, am holding the bond. And now there's more money circulating. Ryan goes to the store and buys something from Bo. That money keeps circulating. There's loans going on. The whole Wells Fargo People's First National Bank, Best Buy, the car, who's our car dealer again? CarMax, right? We got money going into cash registers, all that stuff. Now, at any point in time, Janet can come back into the system and say, Hey, you know what? I've got a bond for sale. It's still got two years left on it. It's signed by Obama. It's still worth something. It's for sale. I'm just a regular market, minding my own business. There you go. What happened to the money supply? It went down because now Janet is holding the money. Is the money out in circulation? No. So on a day-to-day -day basis, the Federal Reserve does these open market operations to change the supply of money every day. That's why the Federal Reserve Board of New York, the president of the Federal Reserve Board of New York, he was always on the Federal Open Market Committee, the member of 12 that determined how many purchases and sales are going to go on. He's in New York. What else is in New York? Wall Street. So he's right on top of the action on a daily basis to go to the trading desk and make those uh, trades. All right, we still got a couple minutes left. Hold on, we gotta write this out. So, open market purchase. If there is a purchase, so case number one here, a purchase of bonds leads to a increase or decrease in the money supply when the purchase of the bond happened. Increase, right? So you guys can visualize purchase. I'm the Federal Reserve. I'm purchasing the bond, pulling it out of the system. That leads to an increase in the money supply. And if the Federal Reserve does a sale of a bond, it does the opposite. And it pulls the money out of the system and puts the bond back into play. All right, we will pick up there on Friday. Um, ask me that on Friday. I mean, because I'd like to reiterate it for the class, but yes. So um, Obama is still paying Janet for the bond, like the million dollars. If, if, if she holds onto it for a year, yes, that money's coming back in. Yep. And the Federal Reserve is one of the few government agencies that actually makes money every year. Yeah. That's another little side story. Lots of interesting stuff with the Fed. Okay, send me an email. Okay. Uh, yeah, it is uh, for your 